I didn't know how excited I'd be, but good morning. Welcome to worship with Centennial United Methodist Church at Ivy. Whether you're in the parking lot, you're online, or you're here in the flesh in a pew, welcome. I'm glad that you're here. Uh, it is quite the cold day, and so today we decided to do a practice run and invite a few folks into the sanctuary um, for, uh, uh, like I said, a practice run before next Sunday. And so I invite you next Sunday to join us again, either online, on the radio, or here in the flesh. We are glad that you are joining us. Um, hopefully you are warm or under a blanket or with some coffee. Um, as we get started, we have a long list of announcements. We have a busy week coming up as we um, commit to being disciples every day. Today at noon, we're going to have a very brief missions uh, committee meeting along with family and evangelism. The two committees are going to join together at noon today for a very brief meeting. You can join us with a mask on in the fellowship hall, or you can join us on Zoom. Check your email for that Zoom link. Tomorrow evening, we have Ad Council at 7 p.m. Jeff will be sending that link out soon, if he hasn't already. Uh, Tuesday night, we have communications meeting at 6.30. And Thursday night, or I guess Thursday day, we have UMW at 1 on Zoom. And Thursday night, we have nominations at 7. So there are a lot of meetings. Hopefully, you'll join us for one of those. Um, most of them are all available on Zoom and uh, in inside the fellowship hall, distanced with your mask on. And another uh, announcement is that Lent is coming up. It's in our midst. So next Sunday is our last Sunday that is not in Lent. It'll be the first Sunday that we invite folks back in um, that, you know, isn't a practice run like today. And then... Um, It'll also be our last Sunday of this Love Actually series we've been working on or working through the past six weeks. Um, so that'll be next Sunday. And then the uh, that following Wednesday, which is February 17th, is Ash Wednesday. We'll have a, an evening service at 7 o'clock that night. We won't be uh, putting ashes on folks' heads, but we do have an alternative. And that'll be coming to your mailbox very soon. So just wait for that. Um, and then the following Sunday, February 21st, that's the first Sunday of Lent. It's also Youth Sunday. So that'll be a fun, a fun way to start off Lent. So those are the many announcements that I know of right now. Uh, there might be more, but I think that's enough for one morning. As we begin worship, will you take a moment to read our centering quote today? This quote, um, is from Nika, who's a six-year-old. And I want to remind you, last Sunday I shared quotes from children ages four through eight and what they thought love meant to them. So this um, this kind of, this quote comes from that, that long list that I quoted from last week too. But this one I thought was especially important for us today. Nika says, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with a friend who you hate. Amen. Will you join me in our call to worship? Rise above the ways of the world. We are called to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. Rise above the ways of the world. We are called to do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Rise above the ways of the world. We are called to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. Rise above the ways of the world. We are called to forgive as God forgives. Rise above the ways of the world. We are called to live into the ways of Jesus. Come, let us worship Christ and follow him. As we come to worship Christ, let's sing our first hymn, It's God is Here. And our singers are going to stand up, be distanced, and they're going to keep their masks on while we sing. <laughs>
begin our time of prayer with singing this first verse, I love to tell the story. <clears throat> for Leslie Lynch's sister, Katie, who had surgery two weeks ago. We pray for her in her recovery from surgery and for those who offer care to her as well. We continue to pray for Pastor David Wendell and his wife, Jane, as David now receives care at Taylor House Hospice after battling with cancer and other health concerns in recent years. May David receive comfort and care in this time. We continue to offer prayers for the Purcell family as Amos's father died last week. For all who grieve his death and for those who remember his life, we pray for compassion and for comfort. We continue to lift up Cleo Mahoney, who is Pat Ady's sister, who's recovering now um, at one of her sister's homes after a recent hospital stay and after having some side effects from many health concerns. We pray for healing, for comfort, and for care for Cleo in the coming days. We continue to pray for the family and friends of Herman Clark, who died two weeks ago, as all who remember him and give thanks for his life, we pray that they may feel God's comfort in their remembering. We continue to offer prayers for Mo Gilkison in his recovery, as Mo is still receiving care at Park Ridge Specialty Care in Pleasant Hill. Mo continues to give thanks to all of you for sending your prayers and your cards. We ask for prayers for Joni Musselman's friend, Kristen, who is battling with health issues and is in need of a kidney transplant. We lift up Mary Ferguson as she recovers from her knee surgery that went well on Wednesday. We hope she has a full and healing recovery in the next few weeks. And we continue to lift up the people who are in our community or connected to this community uh, who are all in a season of receiving care and treatments. These folks include Cindy, Kathy Johnston, Maggie Stout's young neighbor Desiree, Forrest Kidman, Jackie Smith, Nancy Dorrell, and Kathy Kane. giver of compassion and you are the giver of all that is good 
Sometimes we are ashamed to share your delight with our neighbors out of fear or out of shame or out of even debate. How might it make you feel, O oh God, when we are afraid? When we speak of you in these hushed tones of fear or when we assume holiness is exemplified in our rigid rule keeping or in harsh separations. Forgive us when we reduce your warmth and your welcome to the rigid rules or harsh dogmas of religion that separate us from each other. Lord, remind us what it means to be people of true wholeness and compassion and loving obedience that truly sets us free. Teach us of the gifts of hospitality and healing so that through our witness, the world may become more friendly and flexible rather than reactive or cynical. True holiness is not meant to be hoarded to just us or to just our friends, but instead you guide us on the path that invites all to experience the freedom your grace offers, inviting all of your children into not just holiness, but also wholeness in you. With trust in you and with the guidance of your spirit, Lord, let us pray together the prayer Christ taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. today comes from the gospel according to Luke chapter 6 verses 27 through 36. May you hear God's words and these words now. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, Offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies, do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. This is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. All praise to the living word. 
Let's sing this hymn together as we reflect on these words. It's Let There Be Peace on Earth. Creator God, you are our source of love and life. We pray that you are with us in this time of worship as we seek to live into and to become the love that it takes for us to walk in the ways of your Son. Teach us how to truly love those we don't always get along with and remind us that we cannot do this alone without your guidance and your mercy. May our every word and every deed make known that we are blessed and beloved children and that we have the capability to be vessels of your love. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to think about some of your biggest pet peeves. What ruffles your feathers? What boils your blood or grinds your gears? Is it when someone chews with their mouth open? Or what about when someone scuffs their shoes across the floor as they're walking along a hallway or in the mall or some public place and you hear their every single step because they won't pick up their feet? What about when someone uses the word literally and they aren't talking about anything literal? Or what about when someone misspells your name? Now, if your name is Linda, it might not be that difficult to spell, but when your name is also a boy's name and the boy's spelling is different, that might get on your nerves every once in a while. And I'm not talking from experience, I'm only talking from what I hear other people say, right? Another one of my biggest pet peeves has to do with extremes. Recently, I remembered this pet peeve when I read what someone tried to describe as the differences between Democrats and Republicans. You already know where this is going. The document read that Democrats are all Democrats or for a weak military, while Republicans are all for a weapon-possessed military. Extremes, right? There's some extremes. It also read, this document also read that Republicans are all for an elitist republic, while Democrats are all for a tyrannical government. What nice words to use for each other, right? It also said that all Democrats are for political correctness, while all Republicans are for free speech. I can't see if you're smiling or not. This is hard <laughs> for each of people with masks on. And also, this one really got to me because I, I don't know. Anyway, it said, while Republicans are for squandering women's rights, Democrats are all for killing babies. I can't stand this kind of rhetoric. It's as if we will not ever be able to have any conversations if we try to believe that Everything we do has to be one or the other. When we can't even talk about our differences, 
because we have created this rhetoric that you're one of two extremes. Let me tell you some more about this pet peeve. I've thought about it a lot. First, this rhetoric assumes that Democrats and Republicans, they have nothing in common. This rhetoric assumes that. And if we cannot find any similarities, why even bother having a conversation with each other? Second, this extremist rhetoric assumes that everyone that makes up a political party believes the same thing, as if we can clump all Republicans into one group and declare that they hold all the same beliefs about every single topic. We can't and we shouldn't do that about any group, really. Christians, Jews, Muslims, they, we all get clumped together, and yet there are thousands of Christian denominations alone in the United States. Differences exist among all groups of people, and we neglect these differences if we're going to believe in disillusioned statements that create extremes. Third, this extremist rhetoric also assumes that Democrats can't believe what it says on the Republican side, and vice versa, right? That if you're a Democrat, you can't believe what's on the column for Republicans. It assumes that random citizens or even our voted or elected representatives cannot believe in the importance of compassion that comes from when someone might call something political correctness, but also believe in the basic human right of free speech in a free country. If we're not willing to see complexity, then perhaps we're only willing to believe in one of these extremist views. When we do believe in this type of rhetoric, then it often only leads to more disagreement, less conversation, more hate, and it prevents us from seeing complexity in our midst. I came across this notion of extremes this week while reading our scripture text from the Gospel of Luke. I'll say right off the bat that this is not one of my favorite texts, and it's not easy for many or all of us. The first few verses invite Jesus' listeners to love their enemies and to do good to those who hate them, as if that were a natural instinct of ours. And while reading verse 29, 29 I read one commentator's assumption, as they presumed Christ's stance on love is the same as passivity, this idea that rather than striking someone on the cheek in return to their striking of yours, this commentator interprets Jesus arguing for passivity, saying that Jesus calls us to simply allow the offender to keep hitting us as if love were passive. It's hard to say if this is the only option that we have when reading Jesus' words here, but if history tells us anything, basic passivity can lead us down a dangerous path path that encourages victims of abuse to believe that their abuse is righteous or that it will pay off in the end, and thus to simply deal with their abuse now. This is a rhetoric used by slave owners to encourage those they enslave to keep from rebelling against their inhumane circumstances, for it was God's will that they simply turn the other cheek. Passivity may not be the most appropriate or the only loving response available to us from Jesus' words. And here's where extremism makes its way into today's text. The creation of two extremes, or only two options, stems from this commentator's assumption that passivity is the only option that doesn't strike the other person on the cheek. He assumes we have two options when someone strikes us on the cheek. Either we reactively hit them back, or we sit there and do nothing, complying with the violence. But what if there are more options to this situation than just two? Or really in most situations, what if our responses don't have to be either striking the person back or passively sitting there condoning the violence? Perhaps another option is to react, not harshly, but to react with love that does not condone violence. Instead of sitting there when we're struck on the cheek, we look at the person and all of their being and respond with a form of resistance declaring their actions wrong and say, do not hit me. 
If we're reacting harshly, we'll respond by hitting back. It seems natural that we do that. If we're reacting passively, we might sit there and allow the other person another shot. But if we react with love toward ourselves, which is a prerequisite to the second commandment to love your neighbor as yourself, then we can assert our humanity and demand that the other treat us with dignity. They may not respond the way that we want them to, but perhaps we have still reacted with love. This is where I think love exists, not in one extreme and certainly not in compliance with violence, but somewhere in the middle of all the complexities, in the alternative, in the dignity giving, in the gentle hearted response. A resisting response is not one that strikes someone back and it's also not passive. A resisting response founded in love finds that there are more alternatives than the simple extremes that were so often offered. Resistance invites us to live into and to admit the realities that one of two extremes are not our only options. And in a physically violent situation, and also in most situations, even those that are verbally and emotionally violent, we do not always have one of two options. Part of why I think it's extremely difficult for us to turn the other cheek in resistance rather than passivity is because it's so unnatural for us. We've been taught to protect ourselves and to protect our belongings that we worked hard for. We've been taught to stand up for ourselves, but even more so, we've been taught to stand up for ourselves at the expense of the other person who hurt us. This is why loving our enemies isn't easy. Someone breaks into our house and we get the revenge by making them feel unsafe in their house the next night, or even more reactionary in the moment. We try to catch them in the act of breaking into our house as we search for our gun to protect ourselves or our families. In some ways, this instinct to reach for our gun has become second nature when we hear the garage door open at an odd time in the middle of the night. I think the same rhetoric can be used for the death penalty too. An eye for an eye, a life for a life, and yet Jesus teaches us otherwise in our scripture today. And even if we haven't taken these words of Jesus very seriously, it may not be entirely our fault. It's human nature to protect ourselves, to react, to find meaning in revenge. But Jesus' words are a step in the direction that breaks the expected or the natural cycle of retribution. For this cycle is not love, nor does it invite us to become love. In our passage today, as Jesus preaches to his disciples on love, he doesn't just use his words to display love, but he also embodies love that resists. Luke and Matthew, they're the only two gospels that tell this story of Jesus imploring his disciples to love their enemies. And both gospels include these passages in sermons from Jesus. In Matthew's Gospel, we find Jesus' sermon or his teaching in this well-known Sermon on the Mount in chapter 5. That's probably a term you've heard before, right? Sermon on the Mount. I normally don't get to ask people to nod at me. You know, I haven't done that in a while. Okay. So yeah, we've heard Sermon on the Mount. But in Luke, in our text today from Luke, we find these words of Jesus here in what folks call the lesser-known Sermon on the Plain rather than Sermon on the Mount. One big difference between the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plain has to do with geography, of course. In Matthew 5, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, we find Jesus seeing the crowds and going up to a mountain where he began to speak his sermon. Whereas in our text today from Luke, or right before our text today, Luke 17, Jesus came down with the disciples and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all of Judea. The Sermon on the Plain 
here in Luke offers a strategy of leveling out. Jesus is no longer on the mountain, but he's on the same level as the disciples, teaching them who else exists on the same level with them. First, in his sermon, Jesus places enemies on that level. Why? I don't know. All that we do to those that we like, now Jesus is saying we have to do though that to people we hate. All that we do to those who agree with us and who voted for the right presidential candidate, now we're asked to do the same thing with those who disagree with us and voted for the, quote, for those who are on the radio and can't see, quote, for the wrong candidate. But Jesus takes this leveling the playing field a little bit farther, explaining the reason why we ought to change our actions. It's not just for no reason at all. It's not just that we love our enemies, but it is also that God is on the same level. God loves these people too. Yes, even the ones protesting outside the clinic that provides abortions every Saturday. And yes, even the people inside the clinic that provides abortions on Saturdays. For God is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked, according to the sermon on the same level. The last words that Jesus shares in his sermon on Matthew on the mountain, however, differs a bit. Where Jesus declares God as merciful in the Sermon on the Plain, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. There's quite an interesting difference here among the two sermons that we find between Matthew and Luke's gospel. For Matthew, God is perfect, and therefore our actions that forgive easily, our actions that respond to harm with grace and resistance rather than more harm, our actions that simply show our love, all of these actions contribute to us becoming perfect throughout our lifetime, bringing us closer to God. But for Luke, with the Sermon on the Plain, God's perfection is not highlighted. Instead, Luke highlights God's mercy, God's kindness for the disciples whose actions that forgive easily, that respond to harm with grace and resistance rather than more harm, and simply all of their acts of love, all of these actions contribute to not becoming necessarily perfect, but instead becoming merciful and kind. This is a God on the same level as the disciples, on the same level as us, on the same level as our enemies. This is the Sermon on the Plain, or the Sermon on the same level. I'm not sure that I want to create another extreme here, though, in discerning the differences between Matthew and Luke's Gospels, regardless of whether we're focused on God's perfection or we're focused on God's mercy and kindness, we still have two important truths for us today. First, we are still called to cultivate what is unnatural in this situation, compassion rather than compliance or even returned violence in response to a violent action. In other words, we are called to love in resistance rather than retribution masqueraded as love. And second, we can't do any of this work, this work of love, without our God who is perfect and is kind and is merciful. Friends, we worship a God who levels out the playing field, even when dying on a cross at the hands of the government, begging God. We find Jesus begging God to forgive those who harmed him, for they did not know what they were doing. Perhaps without this God, we would have never been called to live in this unnatural way that begs us to forgive and to resist evil when returning the violence is so much easier and feels better. But when God took on flesh, when love became flesh, Christ in God made all the difference in human history. For Christ changed the very definition of love in his life, death, and in his resurrection. Because Jesus deemed every person worthy of love. Even the neighbor across the street with the Biden sign still up months after the election ended, we get it, take the sign down already. To help cultivate love that resists, 
Instead of love that reacts, we need the help of God's persisting and perfect grace. We won't get it right on the first try and probably not on the 100th try either, but we begin with a choice. Are we willing to be love that sees the good even in the person that we once deemed unworthy of God's love? Are we willing to let love change us and our lives? This is the kind of messy, complex commitment that Jesus asks of his disciples in Luke's sermon on the same level. Sure, it'd be much easier, more attractive to find and to teach the three easy steps to love, or the five paths to a better life. These are the types of sermons that people enjoy because they're concise and they're organized and they're simple, which is everything that this sermon isn't. And maybe concise and organized and simple is everything that scripture isn't either. Scripture certainly isn't concise. There are four gospels when it'd be a whole lot easier if there was just one. Scripture really isn't organized. It's not even organized chronologically. Most scholars believe that 1 Thessalonians is the first book written in the New Testament, and yet we find 1 Thessalonians 13 books in. And scripture certainly isn't simple. If it were, we would not have spent the last 2,000 years as a church debating who is and who is not welcome into this pulpit or even this church or the church, right? Based on gender, race, sexuality, abilities, and so much more. If only scripture were simple, concise, and organized. And like scripture, our faith and our love is incredibly, is not concise, it's not organized, and it's not simple. If I could rewrite Paul's words from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that we read recently, here's what I would say. Instead of writing that love is patient and kind, it is those things, but I'd also add this. Love is messy. Love is complex. Love exists in the resisting middle, and it denies the extremes as the only realities. Love messes up and it apologizes. Love forgives and love listens. Love does not assume the worst and love is open to learning new things even about people who we have known for 50 more years. Love is radical and full of God's grace. Love resists and love persists. Love is the bringing about of God's kingdom, not by threats or by demands, but by gentleness and by kindness. For that is what and who God is. God is love, even in the face of enemies. May we be so also. Amen. As we um, try and figure out how offering is going to look, <laughs> bear with us, I guess. Um, if you have an offering and you're here, um, let us know, or else you probably already put it in the, um, the offering basket. But Galen can come by and grab it for you if you haven't already. If you're in the parking lot, will you honk once to let us know you're here? Will you honk twice to let us know that you have something to give and Galen will come outside? I only heard one out. So that didn't work very well. I'm sorry. <laughs> if you're worshiping with us online, you can continue to give in many ways, including um, sending your gifts in the mail or going on our website to give. Um, but we're going to take a few moments to sing a beautiful song as we allow this to be an offering time. Offer yourselves in prayer um, and listen here today.
Let us pray. Lord of love and compassion, the road of discipleship may be easier if we knew exactly what gifts we were to bring to your altar. Help us remember that it is not just the writing of a check and walking away that you call us to. Remind us again, O Lord, that offerings we give each week are meant to be examples of our lives. When we present our tithes and our offerings, we also present the real challenges of, your, of our discipleship. As you send us into the world to respond in radical love to those who may judge, hurt, or even threaten us. We offer these gifts to and pray in the name of Jesus Christ who loved and forgave even those who nailed him to a cross. Amen. To end our, oh, we can be seated. <laughs> to end our worship together today, let's keep singing and thinking about love as we sing Loving Spirit. today is a great day to love those you don't like that much because the Super Bowl is today and you may be really invested in one of those teams and really not invested in the other. So be kind to whoever you spend your day with and also be safe um, because it is still a pandemic and uh, that's all I have to say about that. Friends, <laughs> as you go from this shared time of love, I really feel the delight that while we are still in a pandemic, the pandemic is um, getting better, I suppose. Folks are, are getting vaccinated. Um, we are continuing to keep, to, to keep taking this pandemic seriously here. So if you're joining us next week, please know that masks are still required. Um, but I am feeling the delight and the excitement that I didn't expect. I didn't know what to expect to just see a couple of, of friendly faces here. Thank you for those who joined us online. Thank you for those who joined us in the freezing cold in your car. Um, be sure to say hello if you were joining us online. Say hello to those who um, worshipped with you. I know that that would be a, a great act of love that they would appreciate. But as you go forth from this time, Receive now this blessing. May the love of God, the grace of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit fill you with the wonders of forgiveness and forgiving love as you leave this time of worship. And may you enter this week empowered and warmed by the resisting and faithful love that demands justice for all of your neighbors, even those you disagree with. Go in peace. Thank you.